Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an honor and a privilege, as it is every day, to have you guys joining me here on this Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning, here on Saturdays. That's Pacific Standard Time. That's noon on the East Coast. And it is awesome to get together with friends to talk about movies and TV and entertainment and all that type of wonderful stuff. And we got a few things we're going to talk about here today. First of all, I've got a couple of topics that I've picked out from emails that you guys have sent to me. Now, how do you get an email topic or question on the John Campia Show? It's real simple. You just email me anytime at john at the john campia show.com that's john at the john campia show.com and make sure you guys put that word topic in the subject line or else i'm not going to see it and of course as always guys keep those emails to 90 words or less or else i wouldn't even be able to fit them on the screen even if i wanted to use them now after that we're going to go and take some of your live comments i'm sure we're going to have a lot of them today but for now let's get started with this the first topic today that we're going to start with comes to us from RT, who writes, my question is on how Netflix makes money on their original shows. Do people really subscribe because of Stranger Things or Punisher? And will anyone drop out when it's over? I, I didn't and I won't. Thanks for taking my question. Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And yeah, so there's been a lot of talk about Netflix lately, particularly because of all of the you know, stuff going on with Disney and their original programming that they're going to be doing. A lot of people are wondering, like, how does Netflix make money? Are they going to be able to compete against them? Like, when the most importantly, when a lot of people ask about Netflix, they're saying, when ultimately Disney takes their Marvel shows off Netflix, is anybody going to watch Netflix anymore? How do they make it? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Netflix's business model is incredible. And they are just kicking all sorts of ass right now. The last I checked... They had 100 million subscribers. Okay, that's 100 million subscribers. Now, it's, the number is probably higher than that now, but that's the last time I checked. Netflix had 100 million subscribers. On average, 10 bucks, let's just flat it out, 10 bucks per subscriber per month. All right? That means that Netflix is generating $1 billion a month in membership fees. $1 billion a month in membership fees. So that, you know, obviously that extrapolates to 12 billion a year. And uh, they're doing pretty good. Now, so then you go to the question, that's how they make their, their monies. They make memberships. So they produce programming that they think will make people want to be subscribing members and get their 10 bucks a month. And at the end of the year, they end up with like 12 to $15 billion in membership fees. Yay. I mean, that's a pretty good day. So anyway, now that is kind of, you know, then stretched over to the other question that I get asked by a lot of people. It's like, well, are people still going to subscribe once Disney has their streaming service and once Disney takes, you know, Daredevil and Defenders off it? And I think the answer to that question is definitively yes. As a matter of fact, like Daredevil and the Defenders and the Marvel stuff isn't even their top rated stuff. I mean, like, seriously, think about this for a second. Let's go over some of the big names that are Netflix shows. House of Cards. Now, granted, that, that's the name of a show that's going through a lot of controversy right now, sure. But House of Cards is the show that really changed the game for Netflix. That was like, oh my, like one of these streaming services doing original television shows that's really big and heavyweight contending. So it's House of Cards, Orange is the New Black. How big of a social impact does that show have? Marco Polo, Bloodline is a show a lot of people loved. Narcos is a, is a Netflix original that everybody freaking loves. Stranger Things is like one of the most popular shows in the world. The Get Down, The Crown right now is crazy popular and winning Emmys. And my wife goes to bed every night watching The Crown. Actually, I'm not kidding. True story. Um, so Anne starts watching The Crown and now she's into all things British. I, I'm not kidding you. And like Corey, she comes over like once a week. And when they do, ultimately Anne and Corey end up sitting down watching documentaries about the royal family. I'm not kidding. I am not exaggerating. I am not kidding. Every night, those two get together over here. They sit down. They pop on new documentaries about the royal family, about Queen Elizabeth. And the queen is just like their favorite person in the world now. They love Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. And I'm a Canadian citizen, which means I, she's still my monarch, actually, technically speaking. Um, so, yeah. And she watches The Crown, like, all the time. Hugely popular show. That's a Netflix uh, next uh, Netflix. 13 Reasons Why was a show that got everybody talking. 
Ozark, a show I didn't like, but a whole ton of you guys did. Mind Hunter, which is awesome. A Netflix show. Uh, then you're talking about like the one of the biggest Emmy darlings right now. The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt is like one of their top rated shows. That's huge. Master of None is winning tons of awards. Um, Flakes, The Ranch, also a subject of a lot of uh, controversy right now. Uh, Bojack Horseman, Dear White People, Glow, which is awesome. I mean, these are all Netflix original shows. American Vandal, which was psychotically good. I love that show. Um, then you're uh, uh, friends from college, Big Mouth, Castlevania. I mean, these are all Netflix shows. Uh, what's that Red Hot American Summer? Or is that Big Wet Hot American Summer, whichever that is? Um, of course, then you had, and gosh, I, and I'm probably missing a whole ton of them. These are all Netflix original shows. In the past couple of years, Netflix has just killed it with their original programming. And not so much with their original movies, but maybe they can start to turn that around. But yeah, believe you me, they are going to be fine. Like, it's so funny because a lot of people, because it's Disney, when they're announcing that Disney is going to be doing these streaming shows, a lot of people ask the question, can Netflix survive against Disney? That is not the question. The question is, can Disney streaming service actually compete with Netflix? That's the question. I know it's because Netflix is a rel relatively new player to the game. When we think of Disney, it's the ultimate empire. It's all the money in the world, blah, blah, blah. I tell you, I'm telling you right now, the question is not, can Netflix survive when Disney comes along? The question is, is Disney going to be able to compete with Netflix? And I talked, I used this analogy the other day, but in the David and Goliath scenario, everybody thinks Disney's the Goliath in this thing and Netflix is the, is the uh, David. Not so. In this scenario, Netflix is the Goliath. And uh, they have to be considered the favorite in this. And I'm sure, look, both of them are going to be able to survive and thrive. I have no doubt that the Disney service is going to survive and thrive. I have no doubt the Netflix is going to survive and thrive. They just have too many good shows. And out of all those shows I mentioned, not one of them were the Marvel Netflix shows. Uh, so they are going to do just fine, and they're going to continue making money hand over fist. All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters, Ali Hussein, who writes, Hi, John. Greetings from Sweden. Love your show. Thank you so much, Ali. My question is, now that Fox and Disney deal is done, when do you think Disney slash Marvel is going to announce their new cast for the X-Men? Do you think before 2020 or after? Love to hear your thoughts. And thanks a lot for the question, and Ali. And here's the other thing. One of the reasons I can tell right away, Ali, is that, that you're thinking straight is you're not asking, do we think they'll announce the new X-Men by January? You're like, you're asking the right time period, 2020, 2020 or before. But let's get over, let's cover this part of your question first. You're asking, when will they announce the new X-Men cast? Why would we assume there's going to be a new X-Men cast? That's, that's an assumption. There's right now, there's nothing saying that they will or will not continue to use the existing X-Men cast sans Hugh Jackman, obviously. I mean, I would, look, if I had to put five bucks on it, I would bet that they are going to kind of recast X-Men and kind of restart. But you certainly wouldn't announce new or future plans for the X-Men franchise while you still have three X-Men universe films coming out in 2018, right? You, you don't do that. You cannot do that. If you're, Disney's too smart to do that. Um, if you're going to be shaking it all up and kind of take like wiping away the existing X-Men universe. You don't announce that before those X-Men universes comes out. Those X-Men films come out in theaters. You let those come out in theaters, have their theatrical run, get onto home video and, and you know, streaming services. So you probably wait till a good five, six, seven months after those X-Men films have come out in theater. And then if you have future plans to change it all up, that's when you announce it. You don't do it when you're still trying to make money off those films. It's, it's much like the whole Ben Affleck and Justice League thing. Like I told you guys almost a year ago, they're not going to announce anything. Warner Brothers is not going to acknowledge that Ben Affleck is leaving until long after Justice League is done. It's theatrical run, gets on streaming, all that kind of stuff, because it's going to affect things. So I think that's the situation here too. 2020 is a great over-under year. That is a great over-under year. I will take the under on it though. I'm going to assume that near the end of 2018, so maybe about a year from now, 
we will find out what Disney's true future plans are for X-Men, the X-Universe, and all that kind of stuff. That gives them time to get all these films out. That gives them time to have the, let a couple of them get onto home video and streaming services, make all their money that they're going to make. Then they'll lay out new plans. Unless their new plans involve keeping all the existing universe and keeping the existing actors. I don't know how you do that and keep with continuity with the MCU. I don't know how you do that, but that is a possibility. If they do that, they could announce it as soon as next month. If they're going to keep the existing X-Men universe and the existing cast, they could announce that next month for all we know. If they're going to restart it all, probably not at least until late 2018. If not 2018, then I think probably pretty much for sure 2019. So I'll take the under on 2020. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. Let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Joshua Martin, who writes, with Disney's recent acquisition of Fox uh, properties, namely the X-Men, Deadpool, and Fantastic Four, does this give Disney slash Marvel more power or leverage to either, one, renegotiate their deal with Sony after Homecoming 2 to allow more Spider-Man characters in the MCU at their control, or simply buy them, or two, buy back the rights to Hulk and Namor from Universal? All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. And honestly... For me, sitting on the outside, just looking at the situation, I don't think Disney's position has improved at all. Not in the least. And not when it comes to how they deal with Sony or how they deal with Universal. Their position has, if anything, their position's weakened a little bit right now. Because remember, Disney, as of today, is $66 billion lighter in the old checkbook today. They are $66 billion lighter. They, they are out $66 billion. So they are certainly in a worse position now than they were before when it comes to how, many, how much assets, financial resources do they have at their disposal to try to make things happen. They're a little bit lighter in the wallet today than they were yesterday. So there's that. The other thing is them acquiring Fox really doesn't change their position at all when it comes to Sony. It doesn't give Disney more power over Sony, not in any relevant way. There's no reason Sony has to now deal, make a deal with Disney. Look, Sony and Disney have a really sweet deal for both of them right now. Disney is benefiting from it. Sony's benefiting from it. But the rights do belong for Spider-Man to Sony still. Spider-Man is still under their control. Marvel can do nothing with Spider-Man in the MCU that Sony doesn't approve. And that's key thing to remember here. Yes, Marvel can use Spider-Man in the MCU. But everything Spider-Man does in the MCU, Sony has to first approve. And that's a pretty key thing. They have this partnership. And their partnership worked out great for Spider-Man Homecoming. That movie was great. Uh, I enjoyed that movie thoroughly. Anyway, I think it's probably my second favorite comic book movie of 2017. I think, obviously, first is Logan. I think the second is, uh, is uh, Homecoming. But anyway, it certainly doesn't improve their position there. As far as with Universal, it also doesn't improve their position with Universal. And as far as Namor goes, I honestly, I don't think anybody really knows what's going on with Namor. I mean... Kevin Feige announced a while ago that they got a bunch of the rights back for Namor, but there's still some very complicated rights issues with certain old contracts and things like that that are seemingly never getting cleared up. So the Namor situation is very, very foggy. Again, I don't even know if Kevin Feige fully understands the situation with Namor. So let's not worry about Namor for now. As far as rights to the Hulk go, I did an entire video on this. Um, Marvel has the production rights on The Incredible Hulk. Marvel has the right to produce Incredible Hulk movies. However, Universal holds the distribution rights, which means Universal is the one, is the only people who can take a Hulk movie and put it out into theaters and do the distribution of the, of the movie. Marvel does not want to make a Hulk film that somebody else distributes. They want to distribute their own movies. So the only way they're going to get those Hulk rights back, those Hulk distribution rights back, is if they buy them off Universal. And apparently they haven't been willing to pay a price that Universal thinks is worth giving them up. Now, according to Mark Ruffalo, Marvel did have some talks with Universal about you know, setting up some kind of deal where maybe Universal does distribute, but at X amount of a cut and whatever, and Universal didn't like the deal and Universal rejected it, which is their right to do. So, and again, has, according, you know, going along with your question, 
Is Disney now in a bigger position of strength to make a deal with Universal? Actually, no, <laughs> they're not. It doesn't change their position with Universal whatsoever. If anything, it's weakened it a little bit because now they're $66 billion lighter in the checkbook than they were before. So it's all about what Marvel is willing to pay. And to them, whatever uh, you know, apparently, whatever the price tag Universal seems to be asking, Marvel thinks is too expensive for what it's worth. And so we continue to have this stalemate until all that gets settled up. We're not going to have a Hulk, another Hulk standalone movie until that get, all gets settled. All right, let's move on to the final emailed in question of the day. And this is the one that I'm sure is going to spark the most debate and discussion. This one comes to us from Renee Bernard, who writes, Hey, John, CNN reported that Star Wars The Last Jedi became the second largest opening Thursday night in history with $45 million, which is crazy. Um, with those numbers... Do you still think it won't catch The Force Awakens opening weekend box office record? All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. And yeah, $45 million it made on the uh, Thursday night. To put that into perspective, Justice League made $13 million on its opening Thursday night. Nearly triple. And Justice League made just under $100 million, made $94 million on its opening weekend. 13 million Thursday night, 94 million. So here comes Star Wars The Last Jedi making more than triple what Justice League made on its opening Thursday night. Does that mean their opening weekend could be triple the, of what Justice League's opening weekend was? Because that would be almost $300 million. John, it would break the record of Star Wars The Last Jedi or of uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. And the answer to that is no. No, because it is the second highest opening night in recorded history on a Thursday night. The number one was Star Wars The Force Awakens. At, I believe, I think it was like either 52 or $57 million. But anyway, it was significantly higher. So I don't think at all, I have said this from the beginning, you can go back a year, Star Wars The Last Jedi will not catch the opening weekend box office record or the overall box office numbers of Star Wars The Force Awakens. There were just too many other circumstances surrounding The Force Awakens that made that incredibly special with, you know, the, the return of Star Wars, coming back from the dark ages of the prequels, all that kind of stuff. You know, Han Solo on the bridge saying, Chewie, we're home. I mean, all that kind of stuff. That is stuff you can't then replicate later once you start it back up again. So, like, I have always said that the, the Last Jedi will be huge, but it won't catch The Force Awakens, nor should anybody expect it to. It's just such an astronomical number. Also, here's another number to put it into context. Star Wars The Last Jedi made $45 million on Thursday night. The next movie below it was uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, or Harry Potter, whatever the last Harry Potter was, I can't remember. But the last Harry Potter movie, it had $43.3 million on its opening Thursday. Its opening weekend box office total, $167 million. So, it, so just because it made $45 million opening Thursday night, just because it's the number two all-time opening weekend or opening night record, does not mean it's going to crawl past $240 million opening weekend. It'll cross $200 million. It'll become only the third or fourth film in movie history to make $200 million or more in its opening weekend. I think it'll become the number two largest opening weekend of all time. But it will not catch The Force Awakens. It will not touch The Force Awakens. I don't think anything will for a very long time. Not Avengers Infinity War. Not, uh, not anything. I don't think anything's going to catch it for quite a while. Because it's so far ahead of everything else, it's just astronomically weird. Now, so that was good news that came in for Star Wars The Force Awakens. The other piece of good news that came in for Star Wars The Force Awakens is that the real audience score for uh, The Force Awakens, for The Last Jedi, the real audience score for The Last Jedi got revealed. You guys know I've been talking about for a long time that there is one true audience score, and that is cinema score. Because CinemaScore actually sets up stations at movie theaters across the country and actually has a scientific poll and they poll actual people who actually watch the movie coming out of their theaters and polling them coming out of theaters to acquire their number. It's not like IMDb. Hey, yeah. Hey, it's great. IMDb has like an 81, 82% audience rating for The Last Jedi. That's great, but it's useless. Because IMDb allows people who haven't seen the movie to vote and find ways to vote multiple times. So therefore, IMDb's 
fan rating is useless. Rotten Tomatoes critic score was lower, but it's useless because Rotten Tomatoes allows people who haven't seen the movie to vote and has ways to vote multiple times. Therefore, this, this really good audience score from IMDb, you got to throw it out. The really bad audience score from Rotten Tomatoes, you got to throw it out. The only legitimate audience score rating is cinema score. And the cinema score for The Last Jedi came out, and the cinema score is an A, which actually makes it higher than Blade Runner 2049. Blade Runner 2049 got an A-. It puts it on par with Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, which was obviously a really liked film by a lot of people. It got the same cinema score as Wonder Woman, which is an A. Um, so, good news all around for, for Star Wars The Last Shut-Eye. Now look, here's the thing though, and I gotta be very, very clear about this to people who love this film. Just because the audience score is an A, that does not mean that there aren't people out there who don't like the film. Nor does it mean that people out there who don't like the film are wrong. Not at all. Everybody isn't, all film is subjective. Everybody's entitled to like or not like a movie for whatever reasons that movie did or did not work for them. It's just that simple. Because I saw some stuff on Twitter last night when the cinema score finally dropped late last night. I saw people saying, ha, I told you, you're wrong to not like it. It's like, what are you talking about? They're wrong to not... What? There are things in the movie that did not work for them. They have every right to not like it, and they have every right to express not liking it. There is nothing wrong with that. And guess what? If it got a bad cinema score, let's say it got something terrible like a B or something like that. If The Last Jedi got a B or something like that, and that's bad for a cinema score, by the way, if it did, that doesn't mean you would be wrong for liking it. If you liked it, just because the cinema score is bad doesn't mean that you are wrong to like it. Any more than the cinema score being good means anybody who doesn't like it is wrong for not liking it. Look, I really love this film, but I'll sit here and tell you right now, I've got issues with it. The whole, like you've heard me say this verbatim now, but the whole Finn and Rose storyline I thought was, didn't work. Did not work for me. I love those characters. I think Boyega and Kelly Marie Tran, I thought they were both great in their roles. I think the characters are wonderful, but what they had them do with those characters in the movie, I thought was a waste of time. I also thought the Benicio Del Toro character was a waste of time. But, so if I've got issues with it, why shouldn't other people have issues with it? Everybody is allowed to like or not like a movie for whatever reasons they want. So, all the cinema score and true audience rating tells us is that, okay, the majority of people like this movie. Great, but that does not mean there are people out there who shouldn't like the movie. Or shouldn't dislike the movie, I should say. So, can we stop trying to convince each other that you're supposed to like this movie or you're supposed to not like that movie? How about you're just supposed to experience the movie and whether you like it or dislike it is totally up to you. That, that's, that's what being a film fan is all about. And then we can debate about the reasons why we like it and why we don't and, and get in some good fun discussion, whatever. But understanding that the other person is not wrong for not liking the movie, nor are you wrong for liking the movie or whatever. And it's just so funny. I mean, I see all types of forums and chat boards of people trying to convince other people, you're supposed to not like this or convince other people, you're supposed to like this. It's a movie. It's a movie. We're supposed to experience it. And then whatever our unique experience with it is, that's our unique experience, whether it's good or bad. So just let's let that part go here. But anyway, let's, what will Star Wars The Last Jedi ultimately do with its opening weekend? Again, I do not think it's going to top or come close to The, to, uh, the Force Awakens. I do believe, though, it will become the number two. I'm going to say this. I'm going to aim $210 million opening weekend. $210 million opening, which again would make it the number two all-time opening weekend box office of any film and the biggest opening weekend of any film not called Star Wars. So that's pretty good for them. So it's uh, it's a pretty good weekend for uh, if you're the folks over at Star Wars The Last Jedi. All right, guys, I said uh, that's it for the first half of the show, taking the email questions. Thanks so much to all you guys who have sent those in. We are now going to go over to the live questions. There are two ways to get live questions in. Number one, you're guaranteed to get your question on if you use the Super Chat. It also helps me keep the lights on around here if you do. But if we run out of Super Chat questions and we still have time, I'm going to go over to Twitter. So be ready to send in tweets if we have some more time at the end of the show. Now, before we go over to the live questions, it's time for my daily commercial break where I admittedly shamelessly plug 
the one thing that also keeps the lights on around here, which is my Patreon campaign. Here, check this out. We'll be back in just one minute. For those of you who have followed me for any period of time, you guys know that I made the decision recently to leave the corporate overlords. I no longer wanted to work for corporations. I wanted to be an independent content creator. And the only way I've been able to do that is by the support of my Patreon supporters. So what I would like to do is to ask you guys who watch my shows, who spend any amount of time with me every single month, to consider going over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. There you'll get all the information about what exactly does it mean to be a Patreon supporter of mine? What does being a Patreon supporter do for helping to make sure that shows like this one and all the other shows I do here on my channel can actually be produced? And on top of that, what benefits are there to being a Patreon supporter? And maybe if you guys can check that out, if you decide you want to be one of my Patreon supporters, that would be awesome. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine too. I'm just happy that you guys have decided to be here today and be a fellow movie fan and join us in the conversation. So go and check out the website, see if you want to become a Patreon supporter. And now let's get back. All right, guys, and a special thank you to all of you guys who are already Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. You make this show actually happen. My gratitude to you deeply. All right. With that out of the way, let's go over to the live questions now. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion to be had. First one comes into us from Manuel Fernandez who writes, Sorry I keep bringing up the, D the Fox deal. Hey, man, everybody is. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Guys, seriously. I had to spend probably two hours last night trying to come up with four questions because every single question that came in like i literally probably went through about 200 questions yesterday that were either fox disney deal or star wars the last jedi related so i'm trying to find some other questions was a long arduous process but anyway so you're not the only one manuel don't worry about it so i keep bringing up the fox deal i've just been surrounded with people screen junkies nick mundy mark andraco hyper rpg etc saying how disastrous it is you just seem to be the only one who doesn't see it as terrible it's not terrible it's not look there are things that concern me. There are things that worry me. And the biggest negative thing here is that Fox Studios, as a movie company, is no more. That's the biggest downside of all of this. But remember, that was going to happen whether or not Disney bought them. Fox, this didn't happen because Disney approached Fox and says, hey, we want to buy you. No, it was Fox. What started this was Fox deciding we want to scale down and we want to kind of focus in on and target us as a company just being about business news, news, and sports. That was the decision they made on their own. So Disney buying them or not, that's all. That's what was going to happen. That's what was going to happen. They were going to, it was going to be no more whether or not Disney bought it. So Disney being the one buying them, the only negative thing I have about that, because remember, the only other real buyers involved was uh, Comcast, who own Universal Studios. The only advantage I see to Universal having won the bidding rights and, and winning Fox and buying Fox was that it still would have meant that a different company could have been making certain types of movies. But even then, I believe the way the contracts are structured, even if Universal had bought Fox, I still think the X-Men rights would have reverted back to Marvel because Fox can't pass off those rights to anybody else. So at the end of the day, Disney being the one to buy Fox really has no negative repercussions on anybody. And so... I still have my concerns. I do wish that another company was making the X-Men films other than Marvel. And I love Marvel and I love the MCU. I just don't think it's in X-Men's best interest to be in the MCU. I also don't think it's in the MCU's best interest to add X-Men. So, I mean, but that's, hey, maybe they can change my mind on that. I'm looking forward to it. But really, this, other than that, understanding that Fox, the movie studio, was going to disappear regardless. And understanding that... X-Men properties and things like that would probably have just ended up back at Disney anyway. I don't really see the big disastrous result of Disney being the one to buy them other than somebody else. So yeah, that's just my opinion of it. And, but all those other guys, you know, my friends at screen junkies, I know Nick Mundy, I know Mark Andreco, like they have their reasons for believing that. And that's cool. I just happen to not share that sentiment myself personally. Anyway. All right. Next one comes to us from Ben Rayner, and Ben Rayner's writing, I was going to ask a question about The Last Jedi, but it contains a spoiler, so I'll wait for tomorrow. May the force be, may, may the bro force be with you. Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate that. I'm sure everybody else appreciates you not putting a spoiler in there. 
Uh, ben Rayner again writes, weren't they working on a, a wonderful, it's a wonderful life sequel. I remember if I remember correctly, concentrating on the little girl. Yeah. I remember like two or three years ago when I was doing that, uh, that other little show I created, um, that there was a story we covered about them looking at developing a sequel. I'll be honest with you. I haven't heard anything else about it since then. I don't know if that's still moving forward or if they scrap the idea or what, but like, it's a wonderful life is one of the all time great Christmas films. I mean, I, I can't go, there's a few films I can't go through the Christmas season without watching. It's a wonderful life is absolutely one of those films. And, um, I would be interested. I'm not excited. I'd be interested to see what they would do with a follow-up and focusing on the little girl and things like that. But again, I haven't heard anything new about it. So you guys may know more about it than I do. If you guys do know more about it and you've got some links to share, please, by all means, share your links in the comment section. Thanks a lot, uh, Ben. This next one comes to us from uh, Luis Garza, 1000, who writes, movies you need to watch before you you decide your top 10. Well, I think if you're going to ask about that, you're probably asking about a generation of people who are like younger, maybe 30 or under. Some movies you have to watch before you say you've put together your all-time favorite top 10. I'm not saying these have to be in your top 10, but you have to at least watch these films before you put together your all-time top 10 list. Uh, and I'm going to try to focus on films that I know a lot of people haven't seen. Lawrence of Arabia is one you've got to watch. Maybe or maybe you won't put it in your top 10, but you cannot make a top 10 list if you haven't watched Lawrence of Arabia. Um, to me, uh, uh, well, Ben-Hur, the original Ben-Hur, Godfathers 1 and 2. And some of you may see, John, everybody's seen Godfathers 1 and 2. You would be shocked how many people, like 30 or under, have not watched the Godfather films. Okay? There are actually a lot. So you got to watch those ones before you put any type of a top uh, 10 list together. Citizen Kane is definitely one you've got to watch before you put your top 10 list together. So I would say th that's a good place to start. Make sure you watch those movies. And maybe if you've got a, a free weekend coming up, just jot those titles down and treat yourself. If you've got a long weekend, get a friend or two or a girlfriend together, whatever, and watch a couple of these movies. You will be thrilled that you did. I promise you that. All right, next one also comes up from Ben Rainer writes, Christmas Vacation or Home Alone? Which you like more? Home Alone. I'm not, I'm actually not a huge fan of Christmas Vacation. <gasps> Don't know, I like it. I like it. But, I mean, compared to, like, the original Vacation film and stuff like that, I, but between that and Home Alone, I will take Home Alone all day, every day. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, Manuel Fernandez writes in, Hollywood lacks creativity, ran out of ideas, and are fewer interesting films. Is there any truth to it or just a simple case of overgeneralization? Um, oh, it's, it's completely false. There's this totally false, false idea out there that Hollywood ran out of ideas. There's no creativity anymore. Totally false. And that usually is connected to the whole argument of all Hollywood does now is make sequels and reboots. No, no, no. If you actually sit down and look at the release schedule, there are more original films. You guys hear me say this all the time. You can probably repeat it along with me. There are more original Hollywood films being made today than in any other time in Hollywood history. It's just that those aren't the ones you talk about. Those aren't the ones that get everybody going out to the movie theater. Like, again, the poster child for this, and there's a lot of examples we could bring up, but the poster child for this is Nice Guys. Nice Guys is a crisp, fun, original film, and it's wonderful. It's a great movie. Shane Black, I believe he wrote and directed it. Uh, and of course, Russell Crowe, Ryan Gosling, fantastic film. Bombed at the box office. Nobody went to go see it. It's fun. It's original. It's crisp. It's entertaining. And nobody went to go see it. So I, I really do, one of the more frustrating things I, things I get frustrated at in the, this whole world these days is like when people say, there's no original films anymore. It's like, yeah, just, just shut up. Just shut up. Um, because, because it just gets me mad because it instantly makes me think about all these great original films that do get made that nobody goes out and sees. So that just makes me mad about that. Anyway, that's just my thought on that. Uh, let's move on here. Um, Shivom Dixit writes, Hey, John, thanks for taking my question yesterday about The Last Jedi. You're welcome. What are your thoughts on TV crime procedural shows like Castle, The Mentalist, and NCIS? You know what? Right now, I don't actually watch any of them. 
I don't watch any of their shows because I have very limited time to watch just TV shows. Um, but I do watch a couple. None of those happen to be it. But I remember I was like CSI. I used to watch CSI all the time. Um, Murder of the Week procedurals. And actually, you could sort of say that maybe even Lucifer right now is one of those, is a Murder of the Week procedural. I actually love them. I really do. I eat them up when I watch them. I kind of get hooked into them. And what makes those types of shows fun, unlike Lucifer, Lucifer doesn't fall into this category, but shows like NCIS or shows like CSI or, or things like that, what makes them really appealing is you can jump onto them at any time. It's not like Breaking Bad, where if you're going to start watching Breaking Bad, I mean, I know Breaking Bad isn't on TV anymore, per se, but it's not like a Breaking Bad thing where you can just jump on. It's like, oh, you have been watching the first two seasons? That's cool. Come over and watch season three, episode four with me. You'll be lost a lot of it. I remember when I started watching Lost, because I was late to the game watching Lost, and I was going to start watching it with some friends, and they said, you really should probably binge the first three seasons. I'm like... Okay, so I had to go back and binge them. The cool thing about CSI, um, uh, or CSI, I should say, uh, NCIS, these types of things, is you can just jump on board, and it doesn't matter. You can jump on Season 8, Episode 12, boom, and you're completely caught up to speed anyway because it's really a week-by-week -week show. That's what makes them kind of evergreen and makes them very easy to follow. So they're actually brilliant kinds of shows. Again, I don't watch many of them right now because I just don't have a lot of time and, and I'm kind of selective about what TV I do watch, but I, I think those are great. I think they're a great medium. All right, uh, Vincent Rodrigue, uh, Rodrigue writes, uh, hey John, big fan from Montreal, Quebec. I love Montreal. And actually, you know that movie website, Joe Blow? Uh, com, one of the biggest and best movie websites been around forever, but uh, it's based in Montreal, uh, Quebec. Actually, the guy who runs it, his name is Burge. He's a friend of mine. He actually is based in Montreal. So there you go. And I love Montreal. I mean, the Leafs are way better than the Canadians, but I love Montreal. So anyway, a uh, big fan from Montreal, Quebec. Do you think Star Wars is overhyped? Don't get me wrong. I love Star Wars. No, not at all. Star Wars is by far the most single important and influential uh, pop culturally relevant film franchise of all time. Overhyped? Tell me what the number one uh, opening weekend box office is of all time. Tell me what the number one movie is at the movie theaters in the last 10 years. Overhyped? What movie just set, you know, just came as the second biggest opening night box office record ever? I, I mean, overhyped? Nah. I mean, look, nobody is saying, nobody's ever said, uh, it be, see, where it does get overhyped, if everybody started yelling, Star Wars should win Best Picture every year. But I don't hear people saying that. Not even me. And I bleed Star Wars. And you're not going to hear me say, I never said that, that the, the Last Jedi. Actually, I liked The Force Awakens enough that I thought maybe it could have gotten nominated. But maybe. But even then, I, I would have put it in the number seven, eight, or nine slot of nominations. No way was I saying that Star Wars, The, the Force Awakens should have won Best Picture. Nor am I saying it should necessarily get nominated for Best Picture this year. No. If all the fans were screaming that, it should win Best Picture, it should win Best Picture, that's overhyping. That's overhyping. But I don't see many people doing that, to be honest with you. If there are some people out there saying that, they're a very small minority. So you cannot overemphasize the relevance and the importance that this film franchise um has to the entire movie industry and to the entire fan community that there's no overemphasizing that it is what it is all right let's let me just reset this all right next question thanks a lot vincent uh and do enjoy montreal i love that city uh next question comes to us from antoine taylor who writes hey john love the show thank you so much antoine um i feel that people put way too much stock in what others think of films just go out and watch it and form your own opinion well here's the problem with that anton okay we got to follow that logic through okay here's the problem with that by your logic and you're not the only one who says this a lot of people do but but follow it through walk through this with me here for a second by your logic everybody should go and watch every single movie that comes out every week forever right Go out and watch it and form an opinion. Well, movies can be expensive. You're taking, you're investing your time because you know probably half hour to get ready to go, half hour to drive to the theater and park. Then you're uh, in the theater for two hours, another half hour to get home. So you're investing an evening of your life is now spent. Plus you're dropping money on. By the time you bought your ticket and soda and popcorn, if if it's just you, you're dropping twenty five bucks, probably right that. Going to the movies is an investment of time and money. It's an investment. 
I wouldn't, I would never have gone out and bought like even this thing here, right? This is a great microphone, by the way, for any of you who are home YouTubers or you're looking for good mics for podcasts, the uh, snow, the blue Yeti by blue um, is a wonderful mic. I highly encourage you to use it. Uh, but I wasn't going to go out and drop money on that thing until I got online and read what other people were saying about it. Now, particularly what tech websites who I trust are, are professionals and they're going to give their opinion of it. You're damn right. Before I make an investment, I'm going to go out and see what the pros are saying about it. What are they saying about it? And then I will make my own decision. But I will weigh, I will make what they have to say a part of my decision-making process. It's not the only thing that goes into my decision-making process, but it needs to be a part of my decision-making process. That's why I really believe in the role of film critic, like good film critics and things like that, because going to the movies is an investment. And before just wildly throwing away evenings of your life, and before just wildly just tossing out 25 bucks, heaven help you if you've got a girlfriend. And you're paying for your girlfriend to go, or help, if you're a girl, and you help and help you if you've got a boyfriend and you're covering for your boyfriend. Now you're spending forty to fifty bucks for the night. Yeah, it's it's rational and reasonable to go out, seek what other people are saying about it, and make that a part of your decision making process. Don't make it the be all end all of your decision making process. Make it a part of your process because you are making an investment. So it's always wise to go out there and see what's being said about it before investing time and money. That's just my thought about it. And maybe Antoine, when you think about it, you're probably thinking the same thing. You're may maybe what you're talking about, Antoine, is people who only base their decisions on, well, the, that critic said the movie's bad, therefore I'm not gonna think about anything else and just not go. You're right, people shouldn't do that. You should take into consideration other variables as well, absolutely. But I do think that one should be a part of it too. That's just my thought. Maybe you guys have a different opinion. That's totally cool. Thanks a lot for the question, Antoine. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see, Paco Sam Niguel uh, just sends in a super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, one of my favorite usernames on here. I can't think of a good username, writes, I'm seeing it on Tuesday. I'm going to assume you're talking about Star Wars. I'm seeing it on Tuesday, and I have been watching all the movies in the saga. I'm watching Return of the Jedi this very moment. I envy you. I envy you. Uh, for you guys know that Star Wars Return of the Jedi is my favorite of the Star Wars films. Still is to this day. Uh, I love that so much and I always get to envy. You know who I'm really envious of? Because uh, is people who get to watch the original trilogy for the first time. I'm, I'm so jealous and envious of people who get to sit down and watch that for the first time. I know you're not watching for the first time, but good for you that you're sitting down and watching that. That's great. Uh, James Welsh is writing... Will they call Scarlet Witch a mutant in the MCU? No, because they the thing with Scarlet Witch, they've already explained her origin in a different way. Her origin came as a result of the Tesseract. So her and Quicksilver, that's how they developed their powers. It wasn't through mutation. It wasn't through mutant mutation, as it were. So they can't do that unless they want to play around with continuity. But Marvel seems pretty keen on trying to keep continuity. So probably Scarlet Witch will not be known as a mutant moving forward because they've already introduced her. All right. Donnie Yasu writes, what the heck happened to Brendan Fraser? Yeah, um, Brendan Fraser was a hot commodity for a while. If you read some stories online, what it comes down to is, what was it, Journey to the Center of the Earth? Is that what the name of the movie, he, that, that fantasy movie he did, that The Rock then ended up doing the sequel for? From what I understand, and this could be way off, I'm just, but you just asked me on the spur of the moment. So if I'm remembering correctly, what happened was, Frazier, his name was already starting to become shaky because, you know, he some of his films weren't as successful as others, but apparently he refused to do the sequel when there was agreements that he would do the sequel. And that kind of put him in the shit books with a lot of film producers. And after that, he just never got cast again. Now, how much of that is true and real? Again, I'm just, you're, I'm trying to pull this just off the top of my head. I'd have to sit down and read through it and come up with that, but... If I'm not mistaken, I think that was the film series that ultimately kind of um, kind of hammered him and killed his career, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shavom Dixit writes in, I've been following you since your Age of Ultron trailer reaction back in the AMC days. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for all the content. Love from India. P.S. Jessica Jones is a masterpiece. Well, you know what? You're not a lot of, alone. A lot of people love Jessica Jones. I don't. 
I, th I thought it was dull and dry and boring and not very well put together. Don't get me wrong. I've always said this. The idea of and the premise of Jessica Jones is fantastic. It's, the, it's a fantastic concept with the villain and all that kind of stuff and the, the fact that she is a victim herself. And it's marvelous concept. I just didn't think it was executed well. And I know that puts me in the minority, whatever. But uh, yeah, I myself, but you are not, I think the majority of people agree with you, Dixon, about uh, Jessica Jones. Definitely the majority agree with you. I'm in the minority on this. Um, let's see. Jazanthan Sassathan San writes, uh, with X-Men coming back to Marvel, it made me think if Marvel didn't go on bankruptcy and didn't sell their character rights, we would have got no X-Men or Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Which brought the comic book genres, which brought the comic genre we have now. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, really, the movie that film producers in Hollywood say is the film that convinced everybody that comic book movies could work again was that first X Men movie. That was the one. Now, some people try to argue, but Blade came before it. Yeah, but if you listen to the Hollywood producers, Blade wasn't a film that convinced them that the comic book genre could work on a grand scale. It was X Men that did that. And. You're assuming if Marvel, pardon me, you're making the assumption that Marvel never would have made comic book movies had those rights not gotten dispersed. We don't know what, what would have happened. It's very possible they could have gone on and made those movies, maybe made more of them, maybe made better of them as they were going forward. So that's always possible. But definitely the event of Marvel approaching bankruptcy, allowing their rights to get sold off to some of their characters was a pivotal and important moment in comic book movie history because it laid the groundwork for where we are today. And it is absolutely, you're 100% right. It's absolutely a pivotal moment and an important thing in the history, but who knows what would have happened if it didn't. Maybe we'd be in a worse place right now. Maybe we'd be in a better place. All right, guys, I got about uh, 15 minutes left. So if you guys have not sent in a, a live chat yet, a live super chat, please do not send in any more in because I just want to make sure I get through the ones that we've got here. All right. With that out of the way, next one comes to us from Yannin Mello, who writes, Even with an A rating, The Last Jedi seems to be the most divisive Star Wars movie ever. Will this ever affect the development of Ryan's new trilogy? Well, I again, Yannin, I don't know that I agree with you. Look, there are five major metrics when it comes to how is a movie doing as far as with the critics and with the fans, and is it divisive? Five major ones. Two of them are critic-based, three of them are audience-based. The two critic-based ones are Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes critics, right? Metacritic, it's got an 86 score, so that's not divisive. Rotten Tomatoes, uh, with its 200-plus uh, film critics around the world, has a 93. That's not divisive. Then we've got three audience score metrics. IMDb audience, IMDb audience rating... <laughs> Um, a Rotten Tomatoes audience rating, and the only really valid one, which is the CinemaScore audience rating. The IMDb audience rating is 80 plus, 80% plus. That's not divisive. The CinemaScore gave it an A. That's not divisive. The one exception out of the five major metrics, the one exception here is the Rotten Tomatoes audience rating level, which is totally different from the Rotten Tomatoes. The real Rotten Tomatoes rating is the critic rating, but they also have this side thing that's the audience rating. And it's, they're two different things. The audience rating, I believe, is like 55, 56%. That looks divisive. And certainly if you go into some chat board, but chat boards, you know, I was talking on the, uh, the live chat here a little bit earlier before the show started. And one of the things I pointed out is that I learned years ago, years ago, if you want to get a real sense of what the general movie-going audience feels about a movie, do not go into online chat forums or, you know, Reddit or things like that. That's not the place to get the real pulse of where the general movie-going audience is. These are places people go to complain. You do it. I do it. I mean, whatever. It's the people, the people who don't like things are the ones who yell the loudest. I do it. You do it. We all do it. That's natural. Totally natural. But those aren't the places to get a real gauge. So when you sit back and look at the five major metrics, Rotten Tomatoes critics, Metascore, um, IMDb, Cinema Score, and the Rotten Tomatoes audience rating, four out of the five lean heavy positive. Heavy positive. Are there people out there who do not like 
The Last Jedi. Absolutely they are, there are. Are they super tiny in number? No, they're not super tiny in number. There's a decent amount of people out there who do not like The Last Jedi. And they have every right to not like it. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are films everybody else loves that I don't like. The original Blade Runner, for example. I know everybody loves it. I don't. So, hey, nothing wrong with that. Um, but to, to, to suggest that the film is really divisive, I mean, that suggests it's like, you know, oh my gosh, like four out of every ten people don't like the movie. Uh, and sorry, the, the real metrics tell us that that's not the case. There are definitely people out there who don't like the film. There are definitely people out there with very strong opinions that they don't like the film. And they are not tiny in number. There's, there's a decent number of them. But I don't know that I'm willing... Look, when something gets an A cinema score, uh, an 86 on Metacritic, a 93 on Rotten Tomatoes, an 80 plus on IMDb, although you really can't pay attention to IMDb because, again, it allows people who haven't even seen the movie to vote, much like Rotten Tomatoes, audience meters. I, I, really, I think we should just take the IMDb one and the Rotten Tomatoes one and throw them both out, to be honest with you. But um, when that's the case, that's not, divis that's not the definition of divisive. I, again, I was in a movie theater the other night watching this damn thing. And you know, I, I'm not adverse to crapping on Star Wars. I hate the prequels. We're not a fan of the uh, of the Clone Wars show. And I even abandoned Rebels for a while. You, you guys remember at that other place I used to work, I used to do a Rebels after show there. I stopped doing it because that show was losing me. I think this season's been great. It's gotten me back on board. But I am not afraid to crap on Star Wars regardless. If it's something I don't like, I'll crap on it. I'm just saying I was in a theater the other night at, in, at, in Burbank here, and when those end credits started, the theater erupted into a standing ovation. Now, I'm, I'm sure, like I said before, that is not the only thing that happened. I'm sure there are other movie theaters that had different experiences than the one I was in, absolutely. But I don't find this movie all that divisive, to be honest with you. What is divisive are the prequels. See, people like me would just like to believe that everybody has common sense and hates the prequels. But the reality is there's a bunch of people who love the prequels. Good for them. The prequels are divisive. This isn't that divisive, really. I, you've got a, a, a very vocal minority of people who have every right, who did not like the film for their own reasons, which is totally legit, who are very loud and, and vocalized and they didn't like the film. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. But when you go to the major metrics, the major metrics all tell us that eh, this isn't divisive. Most people like this film. So anyway, that's just the way I kind of see it. Again, that does not undermine anybody who doesn't like the film. That in no way undermines anybody's position who does not like the film. That's awesome if you don't like it. You know why? Because film is subjective. You had an experience with it and it was different than mine. And that's great. And we'll have a lot of films that we agree on. We'll have some films we disagree on. Nothing wrong with that. That's the fun thing about being a film fan. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. Uh, let's see. Crimson ID4 writes, I feel bad for Blue Sky. Yeah, uh, They opened their film against one of the biggest movies of the decade, not knowing their future value as a company uh, with Disney or elsewhere. Uh, with Disney or elsewhere would likely hinge on that film. Yeah, I mean, you look, I'm sure Hollywood is filled with stories, man. And you're absolutely right to bring that up, Crimson. Is that Hollywood is filled with stories about bad timing. Bad timing has been the silent killer that has killed a lot of dreams and killed a lot of projects of things that you do everything right. And yet bad timing ends up being the silent killer of what you do. It's going to be very interesting. Like one the blue sky is going to be one of these really interesting facets of this whole thing that I'm going to be really interested in seeing how this all shakes out. I mean, it's a significant player. Let's see what happens with that moving forward. Anyway, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. Uh, Manuel Fernandez writes in, would you call Disney the exception to the phrase, all corporations only care about themselves and money and not the audience? Or do they also apply? Look, of course all corporations care about is money. Get that through your heads, all of us. Corporations exist to make money. But that doesn't mean they don't care about the audience. They have to care about the audience because getting the audience to like what you do is your key to making money. They are not two separate things divorced from each other. Disney cares about what the audience likes because the audience liking their shit is the basis for Disney making money. Universal cares about what the audience thinks because the audience buying into what they're making is their key to making money. 
They all care about what the audience or general public thinks because they're the ones they get their money from. So the two are not mutually exclusive. They are not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. Disney, all Disney cares about is making money. Make no mistake about it. That's all they care about. But that's all Warner Brothers cares about. That's all Universal cares about. That's all any of them care. No, that's not to say that these corporations don't do good charitable things. and all. Of course they do. Absolutely. But the bottom line is corporations exist who make money. That includes film and television studios. But that does not preclude them from not caring about what the audience wants because that's who they get their money off of. So they want to give the audience what they want. So of course they care. The two are not mutually exclusive terms. So uh, we need to understand that. We, need, we as film fans need to understand that. All right. Next one comes to us from Curtis Lopez who writes, uh, where were you when Disney bought Lucasfilm? I remember exactly where I was. Like you talk to people, they remember like people who are old enough, obviously I'm not, but people who are old enough, you talk to them, they know, they remember where they were when they found out John F. Kennedy was shot. Everybody remembers where they were. I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news that Disney had bought Lucasfilm. It was like six o'clock. It was after work hours at any rate. And I was in our AMC studio here in Burbank, California. And now this is back in the day when I believe it was still just me Dennis, um, Roth, and I think we had one or two hosts working with us, but there was just, and, but in the office was just me, Dennis and Roth, I believe. I think that was the time. I don't think Amy Rose had started working with us yet, but I was alone in the office. It was after regular working hours and the news dropped. And I remember sitting at my computer going, and then starting after getting out of shock, rushing around to make a video about about Lucasfilm having, uh, about uh, Disney just buying Lucasfilm and that there are new Star Wars movies coming in. Freaking the hell out. I will always remember where I was when that happened. Thanks for bringing that up, Curtis. Uh, Lerd little Nerdy Birdie writes, Hey, I just wanted to send some cheer your way. Thank you so much, Little Nerdy Birdie. I really appreciate that, man. That's really kind of you. Uh, Curtis Lopez writes, uh, Best Comic-Con panel you've ever attended. Oh. Besides my own? Um... Best Comic-Con panel I ever attended. Gosh, there was this great one. Even though it was for a show that I've only watched a little bit of, it was one of the funniest panels I've ever been to. It was that Alan Tudyk uh, show, Con Man. And Nathan Fillion was in that show. And the panel for that show at Comic-Con was really funny. It was really, really funny. That was one of my favorite panels I've ever... I've been to a number of great panels at Comic-Con, but that was probably the one I laughed at the most. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from Inferno, who writes, Sup, John? Love what you do. What's your thoughts about Wind River? And do you think it has a shot to be nominated for Best Picture? Keep up the good work. I love Wind River. Love it. Um, I still have a couple of important films I got to see, but I'll be surprised if Wind River doesn't end up in my top five. I absolutely believe Wind River has a shot at a Best Picture nomination. It is a brilliantly done film. I love it. I was like so impacted by it when I watched it. Like I felt it for like two or three days after I saw it. I still felt the movie. You know what I mean? And I just adored it. Uh, one of the best uh, performances, I mean, from everybody in the movie. It's just, it's a great movie. Yeah, if you have not seen Wind River, go check it out. I absolutely adore it. Uh, let's see. Sam Solomon writes, hey, John, what do you think? Uh, that The Last Jedi was hyped way too much, my man. Uh, no, I, get, I don't think it was hyped way too much. I don't. I think it was the event it promised to be. Some people didn't like it. A lot of people liked it. But you're going to get that with any movie. I do not think it was overhyped. It was a, for me, I adored it. Notwithstanding the problems I have with the film, and I've been on record with the problems I have with the film. But uh, overall, I just loved it. So to me, it wasn't overhyped. Um, Derek Reisner writes three Star Wars prequels score a minus people loved those thoughts. Look, you can go back through any scoring system and find aberrations. You can any of them, Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, whatever you can go back. But look, I think a lot of people were like me when I first saw the Phantom Menace, I deluded myself into thinking I liked it. And I would have been one of the people coming out of the theater, giving it a thumbs up. That's never happened to me since, like not since the prequels have I ever had another experience like that in the thousands of movies I've watched since, that's never happened. But if, if it happened to me, it happened to a lot of people. We just, can, and look, by the way, the Rotten Tomatoes score, look at the Rotten Tomatoes score for the prequels. They're pretty high. 
I think we were all just so taken with it that it's, but the difference, here's the big difference between my experience with like the prequels and my experience with like the new films. Every time I watched Phantom Menace and I saw it like 18 times, 19 times in theaters, partially because at the time I was also working at a visual effects company and the Phantom Menace at the time was the most groundbreaking revolutionary visual effects film ever made at the time. So me and my fellow workmates at the visual effects company, we would go staff meeting and we would leave in the middle of the afternoon and go and watch Phantom Menace. And we called it a staff meeting anyway. But every time I watched the Phantom Menace, I liked it less and less and less and less. Then the same thing happened with the, with the following Star Wars films. It's like I watched it and go, okay, this one was good. And then I watch it again. It's like, okay, it's still okay. And then I watch it again. It's like, eh, it's not so okay. And then I watch it again and say, no, this isn't a good movie. My experience with the new films have been completely the opposite. Like I went and saw The Force Awakens and I quite liked it. But every time, I didn't love it, but I quite liked it. But every time I watched it after that, I enjoyed it more and more and more and more. I've seen The Last Jedi now three times. Same experience. I quite liked it. I had problems with the Finn stuff and all that kind of nonsense. I quite liked it the first time I saw it. But then the more I saw it, I liked it more and more and more. I've seen it three times now. Every time I've seen it, I've enjoyed it even more, which is the exact opposite um, experience I had with the original, with the prequel trilogy, in which I liked it less and less and less and less every time I saw it. So uh, different experience with these ones. But again, if you want to sit down, and there are going to be people out there who have dedicated themselves now to try to convince people not to like The Last Jedi. And now that the cinema score comes out, what they're going to do is try to research those one out of a thousand times that, oh, here's a movie that everybody doesn't like now, and look, it had a, not a bad cinema score. There are people going to try to do that. And you can find those examples with any of the scoring systems. You can. But cinema score is still the most reliable one. But the prequels just fooled us all, man. The prequels fooled us all. Uh, dang shit writes... Uh, why is DOJ to block um, AT&T and Warner Brothers, but not Disney Fox? I did not hear that AT&T is blocking the Warner Brothers thing. Hold on a second. Let me just pull something up here just to double check. Uh, AT&T, Warner Brothers, take over. Uh, well, first of all, I have not heard that. Um, no, it looks like everything's moving forward. But at, at any rate. Um, you have to understand that the, the situation between Warner Brothers and AT&T is totally different from the Warner Brothers and Fox situation. AT&T is actually, if everything goes through, AT&T is buying Warner Brothers. They are buying Warner Brothers, the whole corporate entity. Disney did not buy Fox. Disney bought a bunch of Fox's assets. And while you may say, John, that's not that big of a difference, legally, it's in a huge difference. It is a massively huge difference uh, between those two different scenarios. And, and, you know, it's kind of funny. There's still people out there who think Disney bought Fox. Disney didn't buy Fox. Disney bought a whole slew of Fox's assets, but they didn't buy the, they didn't buy the entire company. It's important that people understand that. And that's why they, the AT&T buying Warner Brothers could face DOJ problems more than, say, Disney buying Fox. And by the way, there are still some regulations that people are going to have to look at. They're still going to have to look into this purchase that Disney is making of Fox and approve them. I just don't think they're going to have any problem getting those passed. All right. Last couple of ones here. We go to... Oh, gosh. Look at that. A whole bunch more came in. Uh, where was I? Okay, here we go. Uh, Shivam Dixit writes, People keep saying the MCU has a villain problem, but the DCU so far has had Zod, Lex, Doomsday, Enchantress, Steppenwolf, and Ares. Is it fair to say that superhero movies in general have bad villains now? Well, I thought Zod was a great villain. Personally, I thought Zod was great. Um, yes, it's fair to say that <laughs> superhero movies in general. The, see, the problem is, for the most part, I think Marvel has good villains. They just underuse them. They just don't use them very well. I mean, they use them and they're fine and they're decent villains other than say maybe Malekith or something like that. But for the most part, their villains are good villains. They just don't use them hardly at all because Marvel has a philosophy of keeping the emphasis in their movies on their heroes as opposed to the villains. And that's cool. Nothing wrong with that. But, I mean... Yeah, some of the DC ones have been pretty... Enchantress is probably the worst superhero movie villain we've ever had. Steppenwolf, 
I don't again. I think I don't think Steppenwolf was a bad villain. I, he looked bad. The CGI in him was bad, but I don't think Steppenwolf was a bad villain. I think he was a decent villain. They just used him like Marvel uses their villains, which is in a very very limited way. Um, so yeah, that would be my thoughts on that. Okay, guys, uh, that will do it for me. I have run out of time, so we got to wrap this thing up. But listen, I know there's still a number of live questions that have come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all those questions you guys sent in and I'm going to make a separate companion video to this. It will be up sometime later today. Keep your eyes open for that. I will make sure your question gets addressed and put on the show. So thank you so much for sending those in. Uh, that will wrap it up for me, guys. Thanks for joining me. Of course, guys, as always, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just go ahead and click on the subscribe button. Click the thumbs up button. Leave a comment below. Remember, we're all film fans together and we're allowed to have different points of view from each other. That's what makes being a film fan so much fun. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. My name is John Campia, and until the next video, bye-bye.